good evening and welcome to Gibson's Bookstore Remote. I am Elizabeth, the events coordinator for Gibson's Bookstore, and I am joined this evening by author Mark Kurlansky, who is the author of a new book just out today. Congratulations on launch day. His new book Thank is you. The Unreasonable Virtue of Fly Fishing. Uh, Mark is a fly fishing historian. He's a New York Times bestselling author of Cod and the author of Salt. He has 34 books published, so we won't get into all of them. Um, but this is his newest one. He is joined this evening by Steve Andrews, who is the author of Fly Fishing, New Hampshire's Secret Waters. And he is also the owner of North Country Angler in North Conway, New Hampshire. Uh, the two of these gentlemen are here to talk about fly fishing. And I believe that the tagline said for your book, uh, the irresistible story of the science, history, art, and culture of the least efficient way to catch a fish. Um, I do hope uh, you join me in welcoming these two gentlemen tonight. Uh, their books, both of their books are available from Gibson's Bookstore. We are open for curbside pickup. We are open for in-store browsing and we are very happy to ship a book to you. Um, if you have an audience member, if you have uh, questions for these gentlemen, please do put them into the chat sidebar. We will be asking questions later in the event. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Tell us a bit about fly fishing. Well, thank you for having us. Um, I'm dying to hear what Mark has to say about my my uh, obsession. So um, this will be just as much fun for me as I think it will be for everybody else that's joined us. So I, I um, you know, I, I wrote this book <laughs> basically because there are, there are two questions I'm constantly being asked that are very difficult to answer. One is, why do you write? And the other is, why do you fish? Both of which I've been doing since I was a small kid. Yeah, I, I was writing when I was in the third grade. <laughs> I, um, and I, I just always had a compulsion to do these two things. They aren't related, I don't think. Um, all they have in common is that uh, um, they tend to favor seclusion and reflection. Um, but uh, I mean, it's easier for me to answer why I write than why I fish. I, I you know, I, when I was a little kid, um, I, I come from this industrial end of Hartford, a very, this is not New Hampshire. It's a very unscenic part of New England. And, uh, but there was, uh, there was this little pond and it had a little waterfall and a rock that I used to like to sit on and read. And one day I noticed this flash of color and I realized there were fish in this pond, you know, and it, in, a, in, a, in a place like Hartford, you, you're not expecting wildlife, you know? <laughs> so I immediately went, we actually had a five and 10 cent store and uh, no, no tackle shops or anything like that. But, you know, I got a hook and a, and a floater and uh, um, I, I just used string and, it, and tied it to the end of a branch and uh, started fishing with worms. And uh, uh, that's how I started fishing. But I have always, when I look at a body of water, I start looking for the fish. I start looking at the bird life, the insect life, whatever it is, and trying to figure out what the fish are up to and then how I can catch them. <laughs> and I have always been like that. Um, and I'm not, I'm not completely sure why. I've gone through kind of an evolution in fishing. I, uh, um, like a lot of, uh, like a lot of kids in uh, coastal New England who don't happen to own boats, <laughs> I started with uh, surf casting, uh, you know, stripers and blues. And I did that for years, and that got me into casting. You know, surf casting is all about. I could. I could stand there on a beach casting for four or five hours without catching anything and be perfectly happy. Um, and that's what made me start thinking that maybe I'd like fly fishing. Um, in, in fly fishing, 
I started learning about rivers and I really learned to love rivers. I always loved the ocean, but fly fishing taught me to love rivers. Uh, and they're all so different and they all, you know, they like all have their own song, you know, the, the, the sounds they make. And, uh, and of course the fish are different and the, the whole proposition is different on every, uh, uh, on every river. And, um, you know, I sometimes think about the whole idea of wading. You know, you put on the waders and you go in the river and uh, I love that. And, you know, when I think about it, it's probably not the best way to fish in most rivers. <laughs> you're probably spooking the fish, especially if you're clumsy like me. You know, what do they think of this guy slipping on the rocks and stuff? I have to date never actually fallen in, <clears throat> but I've come close. I think the, the only two really firm laws about fly fishing is that you, you got to get your fly in the water and you got to not fall in. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Um, you know, there's certain rivers that I fish in. There's this one river in, in Idaho, you know, that are so clear that, you know, you're looking at the fish and they're looking at you and you gotta, you gotta hide on the bank somewhere, um, so that they don't see you. Um, so it's not always the greatest idea to be wading in the river, but it's just great. I love wading in the river. You know, you feel like you're a part of the river. You feel the, the, the current against your legs and, um uh it's it's just the it, it's it's the greatest feeling because i think what really uh what really drives you is having a sense that you're participating in this thing this incredible ecology of the river well and each time you go back to that place in the river it's different you know it's uh, when you're fishing rivers you're never fishing the same place twice it's right so there's a there's a, there's a river in Idaho that I, I fish every year, sometimes several times a year, often in the same spots, but it's always different. And that's, you know, that's, I think, one of the big appeals to not just fly fishers, but all anglers is you just never really know what what's in store that day. You know, you, you may not. Yeah, well, I mean, this is the thing about fly fishing. This is why I say the unreasonable virtue of fly fishing. Fly fishing is a ridiculous way to try to catch a fish. I mean, if you were hungry, you know, <laughs> you're starving, you wouldn't go fly fishing. <laughs> it's it's set up so that it's it's extremely unlikely for you to catch a fish. I mean, you, you do catch them and, you know, you have days when you catch a lot of them. Um, but it's it, it's uh, it's by design an extremely difficult way to catch a, a fish, and and the the odds are kind of against you, and and that's kind of you know part of the fun of it. I go out there, I step in the river, and I have no idea will this be a day when I, I catch no fish at all? Maybe I'm fine with that. Uh, I don't have to catch fish. I'm strictly catch and release anyway. I'm, I'm usually fishing in places where I'm not, I don't have the possibility of cooking. So I, it's just, uh, um, and I, um, I have a great day, regardless of how many or how few fish I, I catch. Oh, that, well, that's the beauty of being outside is there's always something. I mean, as you're telling this, uh, as you're saying this, I'm thinking of a pond that I was float tubing in uh, this summer, and it wasn't particularly productive, but just around dusk, a doe and her fawn came down to the water's edge for a drink of water, and it totally made the whole night worth it just seeing that happen even Absolutely. though the fishing was you know less than expected and that's that's one of the reasons i love winter fishing um in addition to the fact that most people don't so your odds of being alone on the river are much greater in the winter time um but i fish when i fish in the rockies in the winter time um you know the the, the wildlife 
uh, have come down from the high country because there's no food and they come down to the river to uh, uh, munch on willow buds or whatever they can find. And so and quite often I'll, I'll be casting and I'll see some elk watching me or sometimes a moose. Sometimes a moose will walk right up to you, which is a little troubling because <laughs> moose, moose are really, they're really very large. <laughs> you don't oh, want to get into huge. You don't want to get into an argument with them. They're and then huge. there's the whole thing about about bears, grizzly bears, like uh, in Alaska, and I fish in the Kamchatka Peninsula in Russia. They have a lot of grizzly bears. Uh, people, Alaskans think this is a wonderful thing, and you 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 hire a guide, a fishing guide in Alaska, and they will offer you places with a lot of bears. I remember this one guy was telling me about this place. It's great because you know when you're when you're when you have a fish and you're reeling it in, the bear comes in to get the fish. <laughs> and I thought, whoa, I'm not doing that. <laughs> um, well, we we have that problem here with loons. Oh, yeah? So everybody loves loons. They're a beautiful water bird. They've got that distinctive call that you hear when they're talking to each other. But if you're in a great trout pond, catching one fish right after the other, the loons will come join you because that slapping of the fish on the water is like a dinner bell to them. Yeah, yeah. In, 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 in Russia, they have these dogs called Lycus. <laughs> They're um, a variation on a sled dog. They're these white dogs, medium-sized white dogs, wonderful dogs. Very, very affectionate, and, and, and when they see bears, they just make all sorts of loud and unpleasant noises, and the bears run away. Ah. And, uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm sitting there in the camp one night, <clears throat> and we had three Lycas to keep away the bears. And, you know, dogs know dog people, you know? So all three dogs are sitting with me because they're getting their head scratched and their belly scratched and it's so nice. And, and then a bear walks into the camp, just starts walking towards us. And I say, hey, guys, guys, <laughs> there's a bear. And the dogs are going like, uh, a little more to the left, please. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, at the very last moment, one of the, one of the dogs got up and actually bit the bear on his butt. <laughs> really? And the bear very indignantly left. But the thing I find about bears, this is grizzly bears, not black bears, is, you know, they'll be out there in the river and they're fishing too, but they'll stop to watch you. And I might be wrong about this, but it seems to me that they're thinking, what in the world is this fool doing? I mean, there they are, they're, they're, they're sitting in the river, they open their mouth, they grab, they grab the thing, and I'm standing there with this pole and this string, and, and I think they think, you know, in, in, in Russia, what's nice about it is that they have cuckoo birds in the forest, and I don't know if you've ever heard cuckoo birds, but they sound just like cuckoo clocks, and so, you know, the bear is staring at me fishing, and what I'm hearing is cuckoo, cuckoo. <laughs> you're wondering if someone's uh, questioning what you're up to, right? right. So, Mr. Kurlansky, can you tell us a little bit about the history of fly fishing itself? Yeah, um, it goes surprisingly far back. Uh, the, the the Romans fly fish, the ancient Chinese fly fish. It's, it's interesting, when you start thinking about ancient people fly fishing, it, it really, you really start rethinking the ancients, because we, we tend to think of them as pragmatic people who found solutions for things. You know, fly fishing is not pragmatic. You know, they did aquaculture and things like that that were very pragmatic, but they, they, they tied flies, and we have some of these patterns, and they're not that different from uh, uh, what you do today. And... Uh, uh, it must have always been a sport, um, but we don't know that. Um, you know, the Romans were, the Romans used all sorts of techniques to catch fish, you know, they, uh, 
perfume bottles thrown in the river <laughs> and uh, all kinds of things. So, you know, maybe they thought this was another good way of catching fish, but it must have been, there must have been a sporting element to it because, uh, you know, you don't catch a lot of fish and it's, uh, it, it, it's difficult. And um, it, it continued in Europe in the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, some books on, on uh, fly fishing started going. Um, you know, up until this point, <clears throat> the way they were, they were fishing was not that different from when I was a kid on the pond. You know, they had this stick and a string tied at the end of it. And uh, they got more and more proficient about the lines. They used horsehair lines. And you know how a line needs to be tapered. So, you know, you might have a bunch of 10 hairs in the line towards the, the rod end. There were no reels. Um, and then down to eight, seven, five. And if you were a really good fisherman, you might, the, 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 what would be the leader might be just one hair. Uh, man, you gotta be pretty good to, land a, a, a trout or even sometimes they did this with salmon with a, a one hair uh, leader, um, but they did. Um, and um, there, was a, there was a book on fly fishing in the 15th century um, that, um, you know, it was pretty good. It gave some good fishing patterns and good, uh, Good advice. Yeah, and Dame, Dame, Dame Juliana. Dame Juliana, yeah. Yep. Dame Juliana is a complete fraud. <laughs> I mean, the <laughs> book is not. <clears throat> but when historians read, first of all, the Dame Juliana thing only showed up about a century after the book. And uh, it seems pretty clear that there was no such person. But, you know, it, it, her legend became more and more elaborate. She was an aristocrat and she was a nun. and. You know, the, the, this was now at the time of the interregnum, the, 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 you know, when Henry VIII was closing down convents and monasteries and, and, the, and the Catholics wanted to have heroic Catholics. So they had this nun who was a great fly fisherwoman. Um, uh, there, were, there were a number of other, it's, it's always said that that was the first fly fishing book, but it wasn't. There were there, there were others before it, and even some patterns before it. Um, but it's it's one that has uh, in, in, endured. Um, and then you get to uh, Isaac Walton. Have you read Isaac Walton? Yep. Oh yeah. Yep. Most fishermen hate Isaac Walton. <laughs> <laughs> I read it because I felt like I had to, or I wasn't exactly. a complete angler, you know. <laughs> exactly, and 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 if you if you know something about fishing, you become more and more convinced that the guy didn't fish. <laughs> um, and there's all sorts of stuff in there. I mean, what is the 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 ode to the milkmaid, <laughs> and all, all these different kinds of things that have absolutely nothing to do with fishing. Oh yeah, I you I definitely would have to be in the mood to read that book. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know it, it it is one of the most sold books in the English language, but. I'm not sure how many people read it. I think all fishermen have it on their bookshelf, <laughs> but I'm not. Yeah, it's, it's not an easy read. It's, it's so little bit. And then he had this friend Cotton and Cotton wrote a supplement to it. And Cotton seemed to really know something about fishing. And then the Cotton parts are actually pretty good. But Walton, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't think that, uh, I, I don't think that he knew, uh, a lot. I mean, I suppose he went fishing. <laughs> um, well, Thoreau's another one, you know. He did a lot of exploring throughout the Northeast, but I go to some of the places that he wrote about, and sometimes I wonder if he was had really ever been there. <laughs> yeah, you know, Th Thoreau, I happened to do some research on Thoreau, and if, if Thoreau had lived in another century, he would have been called a hippie. Right. And he was this very kind of scruffy guy. And really what he wanted to do, his thing was to talk women into getting into his canoe with him. <laughs> and <take> him out <laughs> rowing. 
And if they wanted to fish, fine. But he, he was much more interested in women than fishing. <laughs> um, that I didn't know. <laughs> yeah. But I'm not surprised. But he did, uh, he did write some good stuff about the destruction of New England rivers. And, right. Um, we have several recommendations in the chat sidebar here suggesting The Complete Angler by James Prosek, which is a great book with all sorts of advice, even recipes for varnish. Uh, speaking of recipes for varnish, can you tell us a little bit about how the tech has changed? It started with sticks and string and horsehair, and now we've got carbon fiber tips and all sorts of cool stuff. Yeah, um, I mean, one of the big changes was bamboo, which originally British soldiers brought back from India. And, um, uh, but really American rod makers uh, um, really took off on bamboo and this idea splitting the bamboo into four pieces or six pieces or even eight pieces um beveling the edges and fitting them together and uh uh it makes incredible rods um uh, my friend uh hoagy carmichael who's the son of the uh songwriter and is a great fisherman is also a great bamboo rod maker and um you know his, his rods go for thousands of dollars uh, I don't fish with them. He says Tens to me one day, what? Tens of thousands. Of Tens of dollars. thousands, yeah. He says to me one day, he says, so what? How come you don't fish with bamboo? You're too cheap. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you know, when you've got a fish on the line, a sizable fish, maybe a salmon or something, you know, and you're, you're, you're trying to bring it in and you're trying to, you know, hold the rod tip up and the rod is, is doubling over and you're trying to find the right ratio so that you don't break the tip off the rod, which I've actually never done, but you kind of worry about it. It's nice to know that the rod didn't cost you $10,000. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, you know, they're, they're beautiful rods. Uh, uh, carbon rods are a great development too. Um, and, you know, one of the things that's happened I mean, the big thing that's happened in fly fishing, and, and Steve, you've, you've probably seen this, is that it's become an increasingly popular sport with women. And, um, you know, there, there's now, originally, uh, fishing tackle was just, it was just really big and heavy. And there, there were, I mean, I'm talking about 19th century. These women are all trussed up and have uh, floor length skirts, and they're handling these huge, two-handed rods and not like a modern, I, I sometimes use a modern spay rod, but these things were, they really went and they had these brass reels that were extremely heavy. And, um, you know, they, 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 they somehow did it, but, uh, but nowadays, you know, fishing tackle, they make light fishing tackle, they make waders for women. Um, and, uh, you know, it's really, uh, it, it's really the growth in the fly fishing industry is women, more and more women uh, fishing. Um, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And it is much easier to teach a woman how to cast a fly rod than a man because men think they can muscle their way out of anything. And when you're trying to muscle a fly rod, you might as well go dance a jig somewhere because that's not how it works. Right. So um, Joan Savannah Wolf, uh, one of the great casters. Great uh, lady, great lady. Yeah, and her background was dance. And she, she talked about how dance helped her be a good caster. And I actually got to see that because I have a daughter who's now 20 but uh, I've been fishing with her since she was quite small. And she was always a ballet dancer. And she still is. And, you know, first time I took her fishing, I could see it. I mean, just the, the sense of timing and balance and- uh, And rhythm. 
in rhythm. rhythm. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And that, I, I could just see how that ballet background just made it perfect for casting. Oh, it's hilarious. I've had couples come in and the, um, the husband will say to me, I just can't seem to get my wife to cast correctly. Can, can you give her a lesson? And uh, we'll, we'll go out behind the shop and I'll have her throwing 40 feet of line in about 10 minutes. And he'll go, how did you do that? <laughs> yeah. And it's all about the feel for the rod, the rhythm, Great. you know, they can feel the rod loading in their hand. They're patient with the 10 and two. And um, I love it. I and, and love like you say, it's, it's not, a, it's not a muscle thing. It's not, it's, not, it's not about strength. Right. It's sort of counterintuitive in that way is that you think like, like uh, surf casting, for example. You know, in surf casting, you want to get that plug out as far as you can. And that's a muscle cast. Right. Uh, but but in fly fishing, you know, to, to get the cast out of distance is, is not about muscle. It's not about strength. It's about finding the perfect rhythm and above all, releasing at the exact right point. Exactly. Exactly. And one of the other things, too, for anybody that might be there that's tried casting and ha is having trouble is if you don't have a line that matches today's modern rods, it, 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 you might you might as well bang your head against the wall. So um, I do a lot of having to rematch lines to the rods that people bring in because the line they have just isn't the right line. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm completely dependent on guys like you. I go somewhere, if it's somewhere I haven't fished before, you know, and I go to the shop and, and you know, I talk to them about what line and what flies. And, you know, I, I sit at home in New York and I tie flies and I never use them. <laughs> I use the <laughs> flies I buy in the shop because they're the local flies. Um, yeah, I want to tell you a story. This is my favorite woman fishing story. And it's not my story. It's Tom McGuinn. You know, Tom? Uh, wonderful, wonderful novelist and a, a serious fly fisherman. And he told this story about, you know, there was, a, there was a time in the 19th century when wealthy British were fishing for salmon a lot in Norway. And they would come there and they would build houses and, and they would come with their wives and they would fish with their wives. It's, it's really one of the first uh, large scale women fly fishing uh, scenes. And he told a story about this, this woman who, uh, um, you know, her husband brought her there to fish the Alta, which is one of the famous salmon rivers yep. in, in, in Norway. And she didn't want to, and he convinced her, come on, you just got to try the Alta one. So she, she tried it and um, she caught a 50 pound salmon. And then she never fished again. <laughs> And then her, her son, you know, he talked her into this one time, he could never talk her into fishing again. And years later, she was dying. And she was lying on her, her deathbed. And as she lay dying, slipping in and out of consciousness, she suddenly opened her eyes, looked at him and said, you're never going to catch a 50 pound salmon, and then closed her eyes and died. <laughs> Well, that's we 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 always joke about that with the guides when they take um, when they take sports out fishing for the first time, and they'll have a day where they'll either catch a 16-inch brook trout or they'll catch 20 fish in two hours, and we always joke about how they better not expect that it's that way every time they go out because it's not. Right. <laughs> Right, but that's the that that's the fun of it, as we were saying before, that you, you know, you never know uh, uh, what you're going to expect, and uh, you know, fly fishermen have gotten much more scientific than they've ever been before, you know, and you've probably run into this about flies with ultraviolet light and all these things that uh, um, 
I, I fear this day when, when, you know, there'll be so many science tricks that it'll become more predictable, but I bet it won't because I bet people don't want that. Right, right. And, you know, frankly, I haven't seen it, you know, in the 50 odd years that I've been fly fishing. I've, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm tying, I'm tying old school wet flies with modern materials and I'm not catching more fish. I might be having more fun because I'm the one that's designing the flies, but right. you're not catching more fish just because of the modern materials. Right. And it's, it's, it's really all about the particular river. You know, it's like the, 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 the British used to dominate fly fishing uh, in, in past centuries and, and American fly fishing tackle was usually British. And then they started discovering that British flies don't work that well on American rivers. Uh, and so they started designing American, uh, I mean, American rivers are just a lot rougher than English rivers. And, uh, you know, yeah, the, the, the English rivers are more like chalk streams. Right, right. And, and they're, you know, so it's a completely different kind of a drift. Um, different bugs too. And different bugs, yeah. Um, if you're strictly using imitator flies, which it looks like you're not, because <laughs> I've never seen a I've never seen a bug like the one you're building there. <laughs> yeah, no, no. This this is definitely a, a you know a, a wild brook trout attractor fly. Right. Um, you know when there are hatches. I mean, one of the hatches that we have here in New Hampshire that um, people come from miles and states around is the Hexagenia hatch. And that's a big, big mayfly, you know, tied on like size four and size six hooks. And, you know, the bug itself is a good three or four inches in size. And it happens to hatch at the end of June, beginning of July, before the ponds get really heated and the fish go to the thermal refuges. And it's the last chance to catch some really large brook trout on dry flies. And um, it's, it's, you can throw anything else you have in your box, but if it's hex hatch time, it's just casting practice. Yeah. I like I, I, I like dry fly fishing. I like I like the way you can sort of watch the whole drama. You know? It is. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun when you can get those hatches. Um, I like pond fishing because you're you're fishing all the different depths and you can't see what's going on. So when you get that tug, right? You know, it's it's a huge. Ah, I got it. I found it. I hit the right spot in the pond. This fish here. <laughs> Don't you like that? Don't you like that uh, situation where, you know, the, the, the fish is there and you see him and you keep presenting the fly and he keeps looking at it and coming up, taking a closer look and shaking his head and saying no, and you try again. And, and then maybe finally, for some reason, you have no idea why he, he falls for it. Yeah, we when the when the water gets really low here in the White Mountains in you know the end of August and the beginning of September, and uh, you know we have to go down to like size eighteen and size twenty and size twenty two flies with seven X tippets, because if you don't, you'll see the fish come right up. They'll follow that fly for a good two or three feet, trying to decide if it's a real bug or not. Right. And then they'll just turn away. So you have to go small to try to fake them out. <laughs> I, I imagine all these things, you know, like I imagine the fish say, ah, you expect me to fall for that. Exactly. Exactly. Or you know, when they start, when you're standing there in the middle of the river and they start leaping all around you, I'm convinced they're laughing at you. you oh, know? oh, me too. <laughs> me too. Especially after you've drifted your fly right over their lie. Right. The fly's gone past them and up they come for something else. 
Right. <laughs> you, you, they're definitely making fun of you. <laughs> so we have some audience questions here, and I'll start with a comment from Peter who says, don't forget the three rules of fishing. First, you must be there. Second, the fish must be there. Third, the fly must be in the water. Um, oh, those, those are, I only have two rules of fishing, and the fly must be in the water is the one. And the second is don't fall in. You know, I feel like both of these, these sets of rules stand up. Uh, we're going to start with a question from Christine, who says, what is the difference between wet and dry fly fishing? And do either of you have an opinion on fly fishing versus Antankara pole fishing? Ah, uh, well, I'll tell you about Tenkara. Um, I, I fished Tenkara. I, I, I fished uh, cutthroats in the in the Snake River, and uh, not extremely large trout. And uh, you know it, it it works out fine, but with Tenkara, you you can't really you have no way of letting the fish run. So if you have a big rainbow or a salmon or something, I really don't see. Um, how you can, uh, Ivan Chinar of uh, Patagonia was, was trying to convince me, he, he sells Tankara rods. And, and I, I said to him, you know, I asked, what do you do when the fish wants to run? He said, well, you just throw the rod in the, in the river. <laughs> but I'm not sure how that that would work. You have to run down the river after the fish. <laughs> yeah. So I'm losing sound here for some reason. To grab a Steve, of we can't, we, your, your audio isn't coming in, but it looks like you're showing us, um, you got very quiet, but it looks like you're showing us your flies. Well, I went down to get a, um, there you go. A dry, a dry fly. And so what is the difference? A dry fly stays above the water and is a wet there? fly. So, so a dry fly. A dry fly has that hackle is vertical. Is that is that an Adams you have there? That it's a, a wolf. Oh. And um, when the hackle is vertical to the hook, that lets it sit on top of the water. Yeah, a so wet that's fly, a, that, that, that's a wet thing. fly, the hackle is horizontal to the hook. And that lets it go beneath the water? Right, that yeah, lets so the it fish sink. Is chasing it in the water. And the dry fly brings the, uh, it brings the fish to the surface. And what I love about that, what I think most people who like dry fly fishing love is that, you know, you get to watch the fish come to the surface and chase after the fly. It's all right there to be seen. Um, it's, uh, I think, what did you say? It's a little trickier. Oh, it's yeah, it's definitely because you have to read the water. You have to right. float the fly exactly in the feeding lane of the fish. It's a lot more technical, but you're right. Most anglers like that visualness of it. And so, um, you know, dry fly fishing is probably the most popular of between that wet flies, nymphing or streamer fishing. Right. I mean, there's dry fly snobs who think, you know, like a river runs through it. You know, when a river runs through it, uh, he's talking about how his father had taught them that, you know, the apostles were all fishermen and that uh, Peter was the best fisherman because he was a dry fly fisherman. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> We have a comment here from Dan who says, I live in Northwest Montana, the native water for West Slope cutthroat trout. Sometimes a piece of your t-shirt on a hook will work for a dry fly with cutties. So uh, let's see. Dan also asks, if you weren't reading Mark's new book, which fly fishing book would be your second choice? What about you, gentlemen? Which what is your favorite fly fishing book? Oh, oh what is my word? Tim, my favorite fly fishing book is a book is a is a book by um, I think you said there was a, there was somebody from Ireland in the audience. Yes. Uh, 
great Irish writer, Maurice Walsh, who wrote a book, actually the, 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 the um, the movie, The Quiet Man, comes from this collection of stories. Um, but they're these wonderful stories that take place during the Black and Tan War, the, 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 the end of the Irish Independence War, when it got really, uh, really violent because Winston Churchill sent in these uh, World War I veterans and they, they brutalized the country and the war. Um, the, the war became really violent and um, it follows these uh, IRA fighters and, you know, they're involved in kidnapping and sabotage and all these things, but all the time they're checking out the rivers and say, oh, that looks like a good spot. <laughs> and uh, in this one story, um, there's this British officer and they've been ordered to, to shoot him, to uh, assassinate him. And he's a Scot. And they recognize him as somebody that they used to go fly fishing with, him and his daughter. And so they can't shoot him. So they, they just capture him and they, they take them with them to this spot where, where they go fly fishing. And then, you know, they're so, sitting around and it's all very relaxed. And one day they have, they discuss plans for some raid. And they realize, oh my God, we just revealed all our plans to this, this, these, these British people and so you have to promise that you won't tell anyone and he says no I can't do that and he says well then we have to hold you for the rest of the war so they did they take take them up to this great fishing spot and they hold them up there to go fly fishing and of course somebody has to watch him so they all take turns fly fishing with them <laughs> well of course it's the only possible explanation for for what they should do and that, that 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 is possibly my favorite fly fishing book <laughs> So Mark says, in New Hampshire, we have these vicious little black flies that act like vampires on humans from Mother's Day to Father's Day, wherever there is fast flowing, unpolluted water. Are there similar demonic pests out west? Uh, absolutely not. Western, Western insects are, 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 are courteous, well-spoken. <laughs> Um, I, d I don't know what, uh, it sounds like, you know, in New England, um, they have these green flies, but I don't know if you get them on the rivers, they're more coastal. They're about the most vicious insect I know. Um, I haven't really really encountered, I fished a lot in the West and I, um, you know, midges, midges don't bother you much and uh, um, midges are good, you know, if you're if you get a midge hatch, it's good fishing. Um, I've never heard of anybody being attacked by midges, <laughs> but who knows? Yeah, you're safe from midges. <laughs> so Christine has another question. It's a long one. She says, "I have just purchased a home on the Connecticut River in the Great North Woods, and I am incredibly interested in stewarding my 1,000 feet of the Connecticut River while also enjoying the rod, rhythm, and solitude of the beautiful swimmy creatures, fish. I want to keep our rivers clean, healthy, and full of life while enjoying and stewarding this beautiful resource. What would be your, both of your, suggestions on how to educate myself to fish here? Should I hire a guide to teach me on my property, to take me on a draft drift trip? Should I join a fishing guild? Christine is a fiber artist. I actually know Christine. She uh, she taught me how to use my spinning wheel. And, and she wants to learn how to tie flies as she goes. Where should Christine sh start? Well, I'm a, I'm a great believer in guides. I mean, good good guides have local knowledge and uh, um, that that's how I've always learned about a place when I go there. Exactly. It's exponentially uh, moves your learning curve by taking out a guide for a half a day or a whole day. And um, the guides that work with me through the shop, uh, I go out with them all personally to make sure that um, they know the water. Uh, fortunately, here in New Hampshire, you have to go through a very rigorous testing procedure before you can become a guide. Oh, really? And, not, um, not like those Vermont guides. 
Yeah, it, it's it's a it's a very it's not like a lot of states you can just go plop down your money. Montana, you can just go plop down your money as long as you have a letter from a shop saying they're going to hire you, and you may have never even been on the river before, and you can become really? a guide. So, um, I, I would I'd definitely have recommend. That, had... I would definitely I would definitely recommend that Christine invest in a guide, and you know. In in uh, all fairness, uh, I do have guides that guide up there, Christine, so I could help you out with that. We also have a recommendation in the chat sidebar here for uh, someone recommends Angus Bozeman, who is a great teacher, great steward of the water, and great philosopher. He is semi-retired, but no one knows a Connecticut River like Angus. Plus, he is just fun to be around. So, Christine, I would agree with that. I yeah. would agree with that. Well, see, that's the that's the problem with these guys. You, you got the, there's a there's a guide in Idaho I've been fishing with for years, and you know I don't think I need him anymore. <laughs> I just <laughs> like fishing with him. <laughs> you know what though? Angus is the kind of guy that he's so much fun that his regular clients just want to go hang on the river with him for the day. Right. You know they they're not learning another single thing from him, but he tells great stories. And he does know the Connecticut River like the back of his hand, so he's excellent. But you know, like uh, like Elizabeth was saying, um, he is semi-retired, so he's not real easy to get um, get a hold of. Uh, you've got Bill Bernhardt that works out a lobstick. Um, he's very good. You got Dave Pool that works out a tall timber. He's very good as far as your what I want to say you know, older guides, but there's also a bunch of up and coming younger guys up there on the Connecticut River too. So um, again, Christine, if you want to call me at the shop, we can talk about exactly what you want to accomplish. And, um, you know, I'll line you up with somebody that, that will, uh, you know, teach you what you're looking to learn about. Look at that. Personalized recommendations in an author event. I love this. We have a question from Michael who's a uh, comment who says, Angus, Angus quit the printing business because he made more money leading fishing expeditions. I love it. I love it. I love when people just have fun with what they do. Hey, uh, Mark, do you have any of your ties uh, handy that you can show us? Your 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 flies? Um, or what's your favorite to use? Well, my, the one I like to tie most is is a salmon fly called the cascade um but i don't think i have any around here right now they're they're um they're very light you know salmon flies have or nobody understands why a salmon takes a fly anyway because once the salmon enters the river it doesn't eat anymore so it's not looking for food so it's kind of a mystery why it ever bites at a fly so the good thing about that is it frees you up to do any silly thing you want because who can say um and they used to be incredibly elaborate 19th century uh flies when they were showing off the british empire and all the uh wiping out all the rare species all over the world and bringing feathers back uh the these things were uh they, they were incredible but i don't think the salmon cared you know i mean thing about a fly is first of all when it's working it's wet you know we look at the fly we look at it dry and sideways and the fish looks at it wet and you know front to back um so uh, a lot of the um uh, uh flies especially the salmon flies in scotland and ireland uh these days are really very simple um and uh and they, they work quite well and, and and the salmon don't say, I'm not going after this. It doesn't have any quetzals. Or, you know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, so I have a question for both of you gentlemen. Uh, people keep coming back to the water. It's not because of the high tech tools. It's not, although that can be a fun aspect of fishing. What makes fly fishing so appealing? It is, like you said, the least efficient way to catch a fish. And therefore, um, as like Christine, I am a fiber artist. I don't call it I don't call it sweater making, it's knitting. So you guys aren't fish catching, you're fly fishing. 
So what is it about the process that makes it so appealing? It must be the process. Is it meditative to go fishing? Well, it is, but it's, um, and there's, there's so many things to, to, to take into account, the, the, the flow of the river and the, um, uh, the, what bugs are hatching and, and, and how the fish are acting. And um, you become totally absorbed in this ecology of this particular stretch of river. And it's all you think about. And to me, I mean, it's a strange thing to say, but you know, I'm a writer and I spend all my time thinking, you know, my poor dogs, I'm walking my dogs. I'm not thinking about them, <laughs> I'm thinking about what I'm writing or thinking about, I'm always thinking about something, you know. Uh, people say to my wife, oh, I saw your husband yesterday and uh, uh, he, he looked like he was lost. <laughs> but when I'm fly fishing, that, that mental activity is gone. All I'm thinking about is the river. Well, I think the other appeal to it too is that um, the unknown, you know, you don't ever know the day that you go out on the water, what fly is going to work. Is it going to be dry flies? Is it going to be wet flies? Is it going to be streamers? Um, are the fish going to be up taking bugs on top? Are they going to be eating little bait fish? There's, there's the total unknown of what it is that you're walking into, um, but you have some control. You know, you get to open up your fly box and pick which fly to put on. Um, you get to pick the stretch of water that you want to fish. You can elect to just sit at a pool and wait to see if a fish is going to rise, or you can fish every riffle and walk miles and miles of river until you find a fish. So it's that, it's that tension of what am I walking myself into without walking yourself into any danger. You know, you're, you know you're going to enjoy it no matter what comes your way. Yeah, and it's, it's, this, um, it's this puzzle. You're always being presented with a puzzle to solve. Um, and, th and that's part of the fun of it. And you know, if what you're doing isn't working, you do something else. Uh, I remember once in Iceland, I, I just wasn't catching anything. And um, so I decided that I was being, I wasn't moving around enough. So I just started walking up the river casting as I walked. And, and, and suddenly I'm landing fish on every third cast. And it was like, <laughs> that's what I should have been doing. So we're about at the end of our event here. And I wondered, Steve, if you would show us some of the flies that you've been tying. Do oh sure. Any that that you're proud of tonight? Oh, and I wanted to ask you, how many flies do you lose over the course of a season that you are constantly tying new ones? So this box here is pretty much full for this coming season. On October 15th, at least half of these flies will be gone. They'll either have been lost on the bottom of the river up in a tree somewhere, or a big fish will have broken it off. So um, that's why us fly fishermen spend the entire winter tying flies and filling boxes because we're going to lose them. And one of the things I, I always try to tell my customers is if you aren't losing flies, then your flies not where the fish are. So um, it's just a built in part of that of that um, experience is uh, is losing flies. Um, this is uh, for those of you that didn't join us at the beginning. This fly is my version of the something from Bergman's trout. Um, Bergman's trout is a as a um, encyclopedia of the trout fishing knowledge for anyone that's just starting out. But in the back of the book, he has hundreds of flies that, that he and his friends 
had you know sat around the wood stove at night um, or at or at one of the angling clubs in the winter while they're smoking cigars and sipping scotch, coming up with all of these um, you know different patterns. Um, and because I live in the heart of wild brook trout country, I love tying these flies. They're not only beautiful, but the brook trout devour them. And there's no prettier fish. Sorry, Dan, with the West Slope cutthroats, but there's no prettier fish than a brook trout in spawning colors. So um, it's just a total experience. If you get into it, you're going to go down that rabbit hole and you're going to love it all the way. I think Mark has shown how much he's loved it just by the fact that he's written this great book. So um, don't be afraid. It's a lot of fun. Uh, it's a very friendly community. Um, and, you know, if you dive into it, I guarantee you're going to get a, have a lot of fun doing it. Mark, you mentioned just before we started the event properly, so not everybody might be here, but uh, you had trouble finding feathers for a particular uh, oh, yeah. fly, fly that yeah. you Yeah, well, this is a, it's a fly called a McGinty. And I only know about this fly because Hemingway wrote about it. Apparently Hemingway uh, fished a lot with McGinty's. And if you read his letters, uh, from northern Spain, they're often about McGinty's, and in the sun also rises. The uh, Bill is fishing with McGinty's, and you know, so I said, I think, what what is a McGinty? Because um, they don't make them anymore. You don't find them around anywhere. And a McGinty is a fly that imitates a, a dead bee floating down the river. Um, and uh, so I started. I. I, I Got some, I got a pattern and I started tying them, but they, they called for this. Some the wings were some some kind of a brown tip white feather. And um, I went to a number of places where I get feathers, and nobody had any feathers like this. So I, I live in Manhattan. I'm walking down 86th Street thinking, what am I gonna, how am I gonna get these feathers? And suddenly these two white pigeon feathers sort of drift by me on the sidewalk. And I grabbed them and I, I cut them to the right shape and I painted brown tips on them with a magic marker. <laughs> and uh, it worked perfectly. You know, magic markers, um, by the way, I don't know if you're supposed to say this or not, <laughs> magic markers are, are great for fly tying because the, 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 the ink in them is, is, uh, is, is waterproof, so they won't bleed. Um, so, you know, it's just innovation. Fly fishing is all about innovation. <laughs> modern problems require modern solutions. So exactly, exactly. Mark, magic marker. Well, thank you to both gentlemen for joining us this evening. Both of these books are available from Gibson's Bookstore. And Steve, I want to thank you for joining us again. Steve was actually the star of our very first virtual event back last April. I'm so pleased to welcome you back. Um, the Unreasonable Virtue of Fly Fishing is out today. It is available from Gibson's Bookstore. We do have in-store browsing, curbside pickup, and we are very happy to ship a book to you. And he was joined this evening by Steve Anger um, Andrews, who is the owner of North Country Angler in North Conway and author of Fly Fishing, New Hampshire's Secret Waters. Thank you, both of you, for joining us this evening. Thanks for having us. Steve, it was Tight a pleasure lines, talking everybody. To you. I'm going to have to get up there sometime. Yeah, come see me and we'll get you in some fish. All right. Have a great night, everybody. Good night. Bye-bye.